Hello and welcome to today's webinar, The Pesky Password Problem, Policies That Help You Gain the Upper Hand on the Bad Guys. This event is brought to you in partnership with Know Before and produced by Actual Tech Media. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got an incredible event lined up for you. Before we get started, you should know that my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media and I'll be serving as your moderator. We want this to be an educational event, and we encourage you to use the questions box. It's there on the left-hand side of your audience console. We'll be doing a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the event. We also have a number of resources available for download in the handouts tab, so I encourage you to check those out. And finally, we'll be announcing the winner of an Amazon $300 gift card at the end of today's presentation. If you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry the drawing has already occurred. Prize terms and conditions can be found in the handouts tab. And with that, I'm excited to introduce you to today's expert presenter, Mr. Roger Grimes, data-driven defense evangelist from Know Before. Roger, always great to have you on. Take it away. Thank you so much. And again, thanks everybody for being here. If I could have entitled this uh, webinar anything, it would be everything I know about passwords, password attacks, defenses, and password policies. I'm going to try to put my brain out. The, uh, all my 33 years of computer security experience. Again, if you don't know me, I'm Data Driven Defense Evangelist Snow Before. Written 12 books and over a thousand magazine articles. And my last book was uh, is Hacking Multi-Factor Authentication. I'll talk a little bit about that today, but basically it talks about the 55 ways you can hack multi-factor authentication and bring that up uh, towards the end of this talk. Um, work for Know Before, we're the world's largest security awareness training and simulated phishing platform vendor. We try to help you teach your coworkers and employees not to click on fishes, basically. But today we're talking about passwords, problems with passwords, types of password attacks, and what your password policy should be. So starting with the problems, uh, you know, passwords are by far the earliest, most common form of digital authentication, probably works with 98, 99% of authentication websites. If you have a website or service that requires authentication, there's a good chance a login name and password works for you. Uh, you know, the average uh, U.S. keyboard has 94 characters. Uh, so if you just use what's on the keyboard there uh, and you were to choose a really random password, even if you only have, let's say, like eight, you only have a password that's eight characters long. That's like six quadrillions of different passwords you could use. So that would be if someone was trying to guess your password and you had a truly, you know, random password and you used potentially all 94 characters in the keyboard that's a lot of passwords that they would have to try to guess unfortunately of course most people don't do long and random passwords and they're not that hard to guess for attackers i like to tell people though passwords aren't going away anytime soon every time you hear that we're going to the passwords the a password list society or we're going to mfa i just kind of laugh because the average person has three to 19 different active passwords that they use across up to 170 different websites. Uh, passwords are used by users, devices, uh, you know, Windows services, uh, Linux daemons, networks, uh, Wi-Fi, you know, Wi-Fi connection passwords, uh, and all the things that would replace passwords. So biometrics, MFA, behavioral analytics, whatever you think about it, they don't work on even 2% of the websites and services around the world and on the internet. So, you know, if passwords work on 90, 98, 99% of the world's websites and services and, and what would replace them only works on one or 2%, you can see the problem that passwords are not going away anytime soon. And the most popular non-password solutions, that would be like uh, Google Authenticator or something like that, they don't even work on 1% of the world's websites and services. So they're just for a long time, we're all going to have to put up with using passwords. Uh, I think it's at least another 10 years. But anytime someone tells you, oh, passwords are going away, I've been hearing that for over 30 years and they've not gone away yet. Um, and the things that you would replace them with, let's say like MFA, they can be hacked, just like I wrote a whole book on it. So it's not like if passwords go away, that hacking goes away. Uh, so just be very skeptical with any article or person that tells you passwords are going away soon. Uh, you know, it's like hearing that we're going to have a paperless society. Every time I hear that, I want to buy stock and hammer mill or something like that. But there are problems with passwords. They're easy to hack. We'll talk about that in the next 10 minutes. Uh, they're easy to forget. You forget that you've um, got a password or you make a password change and go on vacation, come back, forget what that password is. They're hard to forget because after you've been using the password for a couple of weeks, maybe you go on vacation, you had a new password, but you're still putting in your old password. 
And the worst problem is they're easy to reuse and share across multiple websites and services. The number one risk from password and for password hacking is when you reuse the same password across multiple different websites and services that are not related to each other. But it's not all bad. There's good things about passwords. It's easy to generate a new one when it's needed. Someone's like, oh, you need to change your password. Pretty easy to do. Works with nearly everything out there on the web. Uh, and it's so easy to do. I remember, I, I love watching like one to two year olds that are putting in passwords on their parents' phones to open the phone up or to, you know, uh, to play with that, to, to play with it and use it. Like literally anybody from one year old to 90 years old can use a password pretty easily. And again, the biggest problem today is the average person has three to 19 passwords that they use across 170 plus websites, which means most people are reusing sharing the same password across multiple websites, uh, which means if one website or service is compromised, the attacker can possibly use that to more easily compromise another website. So like they compromise your Instagram account and they use that to take over your Amazon account that has your credit card or something like that. And there's lots of different ways you can attack them. Uh, there's all these component dependencies in any one of these particular areas that works with all of these are, you know, can be used in attack against any type of authentication solution um, can be attacked. But I don't want to talk about all of that today. That's a that's a kind of a, that's a graphic out of my hacking multi-factor authentication book. This is really the most popular types of password attacks. And I'm going to cover each of these in more detail, plus some more uh, in just a minute. But the most common way that your password gets compromised is social engineering using emails or websites, or it can be through, you know, Instagram or something where someone's like, oh, you're your account was, you know, hacked, click here to confirm and see whether or not it was compromised or, you know, just sign in here. That sort of thing could be an email where they tell you, oh, log in here. Or I love this email, this training reminder due date. This is a real phishing email that claims to come from no before that was sent to a no before customer telling them that they had to take training. But if you look at the link um, that they're telling them to click on, it has nothing to do with no before. And even I got to love this one. It says the link is no be.e 4com So not no before.com, but no be.e 4 Com. I got to say that's kind of a use some ingenuity type thing. But the most common way that people have their passwords compromised is by being fished out of them. And that's a place where, you know, MFA can help because if you don't have a password to be fished, you can't accidentally give it away. So MFA can certainly significantly help in that case. Uh, sometimes the attackers will just try to guess your password, especially if you have a shorter, more common password. They can try to brute force your password by just simply guessing uh, sequentially in a row. That's known as brute forcing like AA, AB, AC, ABC, you know, just guessing one at a time until they find out your password. Most password attackers, guessers, uh, try to do what's called a dictionary attack, which is they realize that most people like to use a root word uh, from their uh, native language and then add some complexity, uppercase, lowercase, maybe a symbol to it. So maybe their root word is frog. And so the attacker will try like uppercase F, lowercase F, uh, zero for the O or something like that. Maximum number of words in the Oxford English Dictionary is 170,000 words, letting you think that, oh, if I'm going to guess at someone's password, I need, a, I need to start it with 170,000 possible words they can use, but the average human only has a working vocabulary of three to 4,000 words that they use, maybe 10,000. If you're somebody that writes for a living or an English major or something like that, you might have 10,000 words that are in your working vocabulary. So most password guessing attacks start with uh, a smaller password dictionary of a couple of thousand to maybe 10,000 words. And then the password guessing cracking dictionary will try adding some complexity, knowing that they'll uppercase, a lot of times uppercase the first letter usually lowercase the rest of the letters and if there's a number it's a one or two and added at an end, at the end of the password or maybe they add in some complexity like a, a zero for an o or something like that uh, but that's called that's what most password guessers do and password cracking dictionaries do is just try to start off with a root word for someone's password and then add some complexity to it 
And they'll usually try guessing in any type of, you know, online, especially internet accessible prompt. So if the person has like Outlook for Web Access or Office 365 or whatever they're calling it these days, uh, or Gmail or maybe like a Cisco VPN, anywhere where somebody could just routinely put in a login name and a password, uh, they'll try to guess at that. And hopefully they hope that account lockout is not enabled so they can guess as many times as they can, as fast as they want. Uh, a lot of times instead of manually guessing, the attackers will use some type of password guessing tool. There's hundreds of them out there. I've got some examples here. Brutus, Webroot, Kane and Able, and probably that bottom right hand one. You can't tell it's not part of Kane and Able, uh, but it's part of a, a password guessing uh, suite called Hydra. Uh, that's really, really popular. But essentially what they do is they find a, a login prompt where they can log in. They uh, upload a password guessing dictionary. They upload a, a log, you know, put in either one login name they're going to use and guess a bunch of times against or a whole bunch of login names uh, that they're going to try and they fire off the tool. They may tell the tool only to guess a certain number of times per time period so as not to kick off the account lockout. Um, Password, if you haven't heard of these attacks, these password credential stuffing spray attacks, what they try to do is uh, the average password attack will take one login name and try to guess 10,000 times against it. What a password credential stuffing spray attack does is it takes a whole bunch of login names. Ultimately, they would like to get all the login names possible for a particular company or organization that they're targeting and then slowly guess somewhere between 100 to maybe up to 10,000 passwords. Really, it's from, usually from 100 to about 1,000 passwords. Slowly, one at a time, uh, because they know that somebody in that organization is probably going to be using a weak password. And it's very true. Even if you have strong password policies, many times there are other password accounts, service accounts, things like that that just slip by, end up having really weak passwords, you know, like password or something crazy like that. Uh, they're very popular today. They break into lots of companies. Acme, uh, which makes a lot of load ba load balancing servers, or, or a lot of companies like Microsoft will rent these Acme servers that copy their content so that, you know, that customers downloading patches gets downloaded faster. Acme said they saw 16 billion credential stuffing attacks in a year and a half. So that's one company. It's a big company uh, with a nice footprint across the Internet, but they saw 61 billion credential stuffing attacks in 18 months. Again, these credential stuffing attacks routinely break into real companies all the time. Here's a news story where uh, Citrix is saying, hey, the FBI told Citrix the hackers likely got in using a technique called password spraying. Um, a lot of times these password spraying attacks actually get done against application programming interfaces. So a lot of the larger companies and companies like know before, we have these auto this automation, programmatic automation that other companies can look into and use uh, across an application programming interface. Many times those application programming interfaces will require login authentication they almost never have account lockout enabled. They're not usually monitored all that well. And so they, uh, many attackers will use them to do their password guessing against. So they won't guess against a login prompt, you know, that we traditionally think is a login prompt. They'll go find the API and password guess against that. Acme said of those 61 billion password spray credential attacks, 75% of them, three-fourths of them were used against APIs. So very, very common oftentimes successful, oftentimes successful because people don't monitor the API logins. They don't even, many many times the API won't require a login, but they'll accept a login attempt and tell you whether you're successful or not. And again, most of the time they don't have account lockout enabled. That is all very sad. Here's a tool, open source hacking tool anybody can download called Spray. It's really just a shell script, uh, but to use Spray, you can download it off the internet from GitHub or other places. It's in Kali Linux by default, uh, but you can tell it, you, you know, the, to use it, you do spray.sh for shell script, dash the type of login. So that's HTTPS or Cisco or Outlook for web access or something. The target IP address of the server you're trying to guess against, that can be a domain name as well. Then the uh, file name of the user login name list and then the file name of the password dictionary that you're going to use, how many attempts you can do per lockout period and then how long the lockout period is. And they'll make sure that they only guess 
a certain number of times in a particular lockout period. And this is what's used to compromise, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of organizations across the network using these password credential spray attacks. So the, the only thing about password guessing attacks is they only work with truly weak passwords. Password is always the most common password. It's I can't believe somebody uses password as their password, but it's really common. Second most common password is password two or one, two, three, four, five, six, or admin or Cruverti. And these have been the most popular passwords for literally decades. Uh, you can actually go out on the internet and look up most popular passwords and you'll see over time, they're not all that different. They switch places a little bit like, oh, it's not one, two, three, four, five, six, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Or it's Cruverti or Cruverti with one, two, three, or the password one, 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 one. <laughs> you know, and you say that's crazy that the most common password would be one, 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 one. But I just saw a video of a, a, a senator in Congress. He was putting in his uh, password for his uh, for his uh, phone. And it was you can see it was one, 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 one. Uh, so these passwords are very common. People make lists of the top hundred or top thousand passwords, then do a password credential stuffing attack or guessing attack. And many times they will be successful. Seventy five percent of all organizations have at least one user with a password on a list of a thousand passwords. That's a problem. And the most complex passwords really aren't that complex. It's really just a root password that also includes well, an uppercase character, usually at the beginning, followed by a bunch of lowercase characters and a number at the end that's a one or a two, or maybe they have one of like four symbols uh, that are off the keyboard. They're not all that complex to guess. They're not truly random. Uh, and sometimes it's not even really fair to call password guessing guessing because the passwords could be either well known or hard coded. Many different products, especially appliances and routers and things like that, come with these well-known default passwords and people never change them or they're hard coded by the programmers and literally can't be changed. And you can go on the internet and search right now for default password list and you will get dozens, if not hundreds of password lists for every device. You can put in whatever device you have at home, put in you know that device's name like, you know, Wi-Fi, Cisco Wi-Fi router, 2567 default passwords or well-known passwords, and it will bring back all the passwords that have ever been recorded as being either built in default or well-known. And many people break in that way. These days, bots usually do it. A lot of, uh, of the bots, uh, especially attacking IoT devices like DVRs and web cameras and stuff like that, they literally, this malware will target particular types of devices and try the default passwords, the hard-coded passwords, and they break in and take over millions of devices. Very, very common today. Among the most common ways that malware gets inside of an organization. And so there's lots of password guessing malware uh, that will guess, you know, 100 or so common passwords. Configure is the first one I ran into many years ago. It's not as common anymore, but emotes or I guess Mote and, and Kbot, uh, those two are very, very common. You can see that they guess, it, like it's saying here, uh, this worm, it propagates through network shares. It uses an obtained usernames and passwords, to drop a copy of itself onto the said network shares. It also uses a list of usernames and passwords apart from those that it gathers to try to access machines. And these, uh, you know, these bots and malware programs are among the most active, most successful uh, malware programs uh, that have ever been, much less the most active and successful today. And all they do is sit there and guess at passwords or some predefined list of passwords against network shares and login screens and stuff like that. Very, very common. Uh, password guessing attacks are fairly easy to put down and that all you have to do is make sure you change any default passwords immediately and don't use any really weak passwords. Use a password that can withstand a, a password guessing attack that's not on the list of the top you know, thousand passwords, enable account lockout policies wherever you can. That way they can't just guess a million times without being stopped. Make sure you turn on log on monitoring and alerting, especially on those APIs. You want to make sure you secure and monitor those APIs and use multi-factor authentication when and where you can. Although unfortunately that's not nearly every place. Uh, another very popular type of attack is called password hash cracking. Uh, most passwords, if you didn't know that when you log in, when you log into a system or a network with your plain text password, let's say your password is frog, it immediately converts that plain text password into a uh, using a cryptographic hash function into a hash to an out the resulting hash. It's a one way function that it, for whatever you type in will always be unique for whatever you type in. And it's always consistent though. So if you type in frog one time, you type in frog a hundred times, it will always give you the same hashed output. Well, that's how most passwords, most passwords that are typed in 
are converted to their password hash and then stored that way on disk or sent across the network, or maybe there's some type of challenge response transactions going on where they're going back and forth, but they'll always use the password hash as part of that calculation. There's all kinds of different hashes out there in the world. There's like a hundred of them that we know about that are well known, excuse me, well known. Uh, some of the most popular ones are here. LM is Landman Hash. That was what Windows used early on. Started in Windows 2000, they started to use uh, NT hashes. LM hashes are really are considered vulnerable and you shouldn't use them at all. Uh, they can be immediately broken. NT hashes are fairly strong. They're middle end strong. Um, if you have a Linux or a Unix system, in the old days, it was probably using NB5. That's considered kind of weak. Today, they're probably going to use SHA-1, SHA-2, which are considered some, SHA-1 is considered broken, but SHA-2 isn't. Uh, but bcrypt, if you have that by Bruce Schneier, that's considered a very strong hash. So you see, you again, can see some examples of if I was to have a password of frog and type it in and it got converted by MD5 or SHA-1 or something like that what it would look like. Well, that is what is stored on a system. Again, that's what's transmitted across the network or used to drive the, the challenge response packets that are sent across the network, or it's stored on disk, or it's stored in memory. And if an attacker can get that, and they can be stolen from your passive storage file, so they can be stolen uh, out of memory. Uh, there's many hacking tools from Linux and Unix and Windows that stills password hashes. They can steal them from when they're stored on disk. Like in Windows, local password hashes are stored in what's called the SAM Security Accounts Manager database on Active Directory. Domain controllers, all the password hashes for everybody in the forest is stored in a file called ntds.dit. Uh, you can also, people can eavesdrop on network connections and try to pick up the passwords or password hashes there. Normally an attacker needs elevated access that need to be administrator, domain administrator, or root on a Linux system or something like that, plus be using a password hash theft tool. There's lots of different password hash theft tools for all the different operating systems like uh, Mimikatz or uh, Password Pass Dump or something like that. There's a lot of them out there. Um, if you're on an Active Directory, Active Directory domain controller, the attacker needs to be a domain admin, which means they're kind of the uh, have the keys of the kingdom already. They can also, though, send you phishing emails and trick you into logging into fake websites where you type in your plain text password or they sniff and get your password hash out of the challenge response sessions. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, common. Once the attacker has your password hashes, they can use password hash cracking tools. Uh, those passwords, there's a lot of them out there. The most famous, one, this one I've got on your screen is called OptCrack. It's a Windows one. It's not really used by a lot of people today. Most people are using one called HashCat. That's like the hot password hash cracking tool. I used to use, when I was a penetration tester, I used to use John the Ripper uh, tool. That was pretty good, but HashCat is the tool that everybody's using today. So if you want to do password hash cracking, get hash cat. Um, but again, what you do is the, as the attacker is you get elevated access, you obtain these password hashes, uh, and then you can either reuse them. Sometimes if you're still on the machine or the network, you can actually reuse them without cracking them. But it's always, if you can, it's always best to crack those hashes back to their plain text equivalents. That way you can use, if you can get a password hash and crack it back to its plain text equivalent, you're getting, uh, you're able to then use that password on regular login prompts, you know, and email prompts and things like that. Plus, you, you know, if you crack it, you might be able to use it since people oftentimes reuse their passwords in other places and un other unrelated websites and services. If you can get the actual password, you can reuse it there. And again, the way that they work is they get a password hash cracking tool like Hashcat. They import uh, hash dictionaries and then that the machine tries to crack, tries to guess as many, like you can't really crack the password hash per se. I mean, you can't just, you can't convert that hash back to its plain text equivalent. That's one of the uh, cryptographic properties of any good cryptographic hash is that you can't just look at the hash and figure out what it represented. But if you get a list of, you know, a million possible things, a million different types of passwords, you can actually hash those different passwords and see if it matches the hash that you as the attacker have captured and then do a one to one look up and go, OK, here's, uh, you know, and find it that way. So that's how password hash cracking works. Again, they import a whole bunch of hashes. 
they already have predetermined what the hashes would be for those different uh, dictionary words and, and pass, potential passwords that they imported there. And then they just try to do lookups to see the hash that they've captured. Does it match one of the hashes in the database? And that's how password hash cracking works. It can be really, really fast. It can be slow, depending on what the type of hash that's used. Again, LM land man hashes that used to be used in Windows can be cracked in one second, and you don't want to use them. But if you use a 16-character plus Windows password, it automatically disables land man passwords no matter what. These days, Windows uses NT hashes. They're considered moderately hard to crack. Anything that's MD5, RC4, RC5, like Landman, is just considered easy to crack and you shouldn't use them. SHA-1, SHA-2 uh, hashes are harder to crack. SHA-1 has actually had some vulnerabilities against it, but SHA-2 so far is not considered vulnerable. Uh, and then you can, again, uh, use uh, different types of hash. Bcrypt is a really good hash to use if you have a Linux, Unix system, BSD system. Uh, and Windows, Microsoft Windows also for uh, your local logins or what's called uh, cached logins uses PBK. DF2, that's an open source hash that is really, really hard to crack. I think it it like rehashes the password like 10,000 times and things like that, or thousands of times at least. So if you have a system that has an NT hash, so Windows systems use NT hashes, moderately hard to crack. It, you can crack it, but it takes a lot of computational power. Uh, PBK DF2, really hard to crack. Bcrypt hard to crack, although PBK DF2 uh, wins over Bcrypt after 55 characters. Bcrypt was mod was created to use with 55 character or less passwords, which most people use, so it's a little bit better there. And again, once you have the tool, you fire them in, fire in the hash, and have it crack it. That you can actually buy specialized password hash cracking rigs uh, and appliances like TerraHash is a company that offers these. Most of these uh, these password hash cracking rigs, even if you build them on your own, they use graphical processing unit. It turns out that the graphics cards that the vendors created so that you could play gaming really fast are really good at cracking password hashes and trying to decrypt stuff. And so you can create, you know, uh, here at No Before, we have a password hash cracking rig that I think has over 100 GPUs in it, um, but you can buy uh, units, and you know, for, if you got $25,000 laying around, you can buy TerraHash's unit where you can fit over 375 uh, different graphical processing unit that can do literally trillions of or billions of guesses a second. You can, of course, use clouds of computers, clusters of computers, parallel processing all together, so you can rank computers in Azure and, and, a, and Amazon AWS trying to crack these password hashes. The fastest one we know about right now is the world record for a single GPU rig is 121 billion NT password guesses a second. So a regular computer, or I guess it can't be regular computer, but a single GPU rig can do 121 billion NT password guesses a second. The world record right now is 350 billion password tries per second. I forget how many GPUs that has in it, but it's more than one. <laughs> has a lot more. Uh, but this is big, and if I've lost you, pay, listen to this right here. That in any NT... Uh, any eight character NT hash password can be cracked in under two hours on a password cracking rig or in 12 minutes using $25 of cloud processing power. That means that if you're if you use a Windows password that's eight characters or less and it gets captured, the attacker has elevated access, they capture it and they go to crack it, they're going to crack it in two hours or less. So you cannot, you need to actually have a password that's at least longer than 12 characters and really 16 characters or longer if you don't want someone to crack it. I think the, uh, as far as I know publicly, the longest NT password that's ever been cracked was either 12 or 14 characters, but really you should say use a, if you were worried about your NT uh, password, NT hash password being cracked, you need at least 16 characters characters no longer, and that's just to survive what we think is the attack. So remember this. Um, yeah, you can see this. Uh, somebody cracked a 10-character SHA-2, SHA-256, which is SHA-2 hash in five days. Uh, I don't know anybody that has publicly announced breaking any password hash, NT password hash, that was longer than 12 characters, uh, although I've heard rumors of someone that broke a 14-character one, but it wasn't publicly announced. And, you know, it could be that even 16-character passwords have been broken by, you know, the nation states or, you know, they, they obviously, the NSA and China and Russia are going to have some pretty powerful cloud-based, hardware-based password cracking, password hash cracking rigs. And so, again, you 
want to make sure that you, if you're worried about password hash cracking, that you use a very long and complex password, at least 16 characters long. And that's just for now, because every year or two, you've got to go longer to keep up with the password hash cracking technology. Uh, so remember this, uh, hashes can, password hashes can be reused in many systems without cracking if they have the right access. They have to, if you're, they're trying to do it across the network, they kind of got to be on the network or have the right network connections that allow the right ports and privileges and things like that. Or if they're on the, uh, a system, they can many times reuse those hashes on the same system or even against other systems on the same network using different called pass the hash attack tools like Mimikat, Wentz, or NTLM Relay. These are all open source tools that anybody can download and use. Those tools usually will allow you, the first two will allow you to capture Windows password hashes and then replay them on the same machine and across the network. And NTLM Relay is a Linux system uh, tool that you can use to replay hashes to insert shell code and things like that on other systems. So lots of a hack. So you don't really have to crack passwords to, you know, if you get a password hash, you can just reuse it if you're on the network or on the machine. But again, there's always a benefit if you can crack it back to the plain text equivalent, then you have both the hash and the plain text equivalent, and you can use which version you need for a particular login system. The defenses to this, and I cannot stress this enough, is prevent attackers from getting the hashes in the first place. There is no other real defense than preventing attackers from getting your hashes in the first place and everything that that takes, although that's usually preventing social engineering and patching your software. Those two things are the two best things you can do to prevent any attack. You can also use long and complex passwords. Remember, 16 characters or longer if you want to prevent successful cracking. And of course, you know, you can use antivirus endpoint detection response tools, prevent hacking tools like Mimikatz and Wentz from being used to steal your hashes or replay them. And then many uh, vendors have tools that they try to do to prevent pass the hash attacks, like Windows has protected LSAT, administrative level RDP, remote desktop protocol. They have like 10 different methods you can do to try to prevent password, uh, pass the hash attack tools or password theft. Uh, Microsoft, you know, every single update, they're looking out to see who's stealing password hashes, how, and they're trying to prevent them from those tools from working. Uh, but let me say this again, though. You need to prevent attackers from getting your hashes in the first place, because if attackers have your hashes, that means that they've either eavesdropped on your network connection, which is a bad thing, or they uh, they have uh, their end is admin, domain admin, or root, and it's already game over. They have literally compromised whatever it is you're doing, and, you know, they don't need to crack your password hash to cause you pain. They're already in, they're already doing things that are pretty bad. They can change your network communications. They can install back doors. They can do keystroke logging. So even if your password is a hundred characters long, they can put a keystroke logger and you put in your hundred character password and they have it. Although many times they will just steal your password. How? We'll talk about many of these things here, but there's lots of ways they can steal your password no matter what it is. They don't care how long or complex it is. They just steal it. Social engineering, malware, hackers, that sort of stuff. We'll talk about some more methods here, but certainly if they've got malware on your endpoint, point, if you've installed, you know, got a Trojan on your system, like the most common password stealing Trojan right now is called TrickBot. Uh, most ransomware and most malware Trojans will have a will either have TrickBot that they drop off or they use TrickBot's code because their code was released as open source on the internet and it will look around in your browser and memory and try to find as many passwords and they have key loggers that will try to record when you go to your website. So it's very, very common when people get compromised with ransomware. And here's an example here. The ransomware got on this company system and it stole their, it even stole the passwords for their password managers. Although in uh, LastPass password managers, they sold their passwords for their personal and business banking portals, their Office 365 accounts, their direct deposit accounts. Uh, you can see all kinds of stuff. They even stole their shipping and postage account login names and passwords and stole employees' Amazon, Facebook, LinkedIn, Microsoft, and Twitter account passwords. So if you're at work, and, you know, uh, the average ransomware program is on a company computer up to uh, eight months to a year before it goes off or is detected and removed. And during that time, it is sniffing, 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 trying to get all the passwords it can. So if there's a ransomware or Trojan program on your computer, any passage you type while that Trojan or TrickBot Trojans on your system could be sent to the attacker. So anytime you have ransomware or a Trojan discovered on a network or on a machine, 
you not only want to change the passwords at the company, but any password that you could have possibly used while you were at the company, like you went to go check on Amazon, buy something on Amazon, they could now have access to your Amazon account and credit cards attached to that. Uh, and of course, if they're on the network, you know, they can do man in the middle attacks uh, on your networking equipment. They can send you stuff. They can run programs like Empire PowerShell or Mimikatz that will try to steal passwords and password hashes across the network. Uh, these are really common hacker uh, password hacking theft tools, Empire PowerShell, Mimikatz. Uh, again, you, people can run them and steal your passwords and password hashes and reuse them or Metasploits, another third one there. They can eavesdrop on your network connections, try to send you like a phishing email, send you to a fake website and have you put in your password on that fake website. Or they can even, if they can man in the middle of your session, they can use tools like Responder. Responder is an open source attacking tool that can fake being a bunch of different servers, like it can be an email server, it can be a web server, it can be a NetBIOS server, anybody can download and use this. And actually, Kevin, if you go to this blog entry I just put on your screen, I don't have time to show it today, but he'll give you a video of how he sends somebody a phishing email. And if they, all they do is open it or click on a link and it sends the NT challenge response to uh, the attacker machine that's running Responder. And from that, Kevin gets the, the challenge response, which he then converts to the NT hash. And then he uses Hashcat to crack that hash back to a plain text password in like a minute or two. It's a really great demo if you've never seen it before. If you've never seen someone send somebody a phishing email and end up with their password hash a second or two later that they then convert to someone's plain text password in a minute or two, you need to go watch that video. It will blow your mind. Uh, of course, they can just look up your password. Many times people's passwords are everywhere. Your password, my password is everywhere. There's a good chance that some of your passwords are somewhere out there on the internet. There are literally 25 billion login names and passwords all over the internet. Just one password dump that was found last year had over 3 billion people's login names and passwords. Many a times it will contain your old login names and passwords. There's even attack tools like a lot of open source intelligence tools like Recon NG. You can a lot of attackers will run Recon NG. You type in you go to Recon NG. You put in the domain name of the company you're attacking. Let's say like Noble4.com, and then you tell it show me all the login names and passwords that are in all the password dump lists all around the internet, and it will come back and give you a list of those machines. Uh, if you don't want to do Recon NG, I highly recommend our password tool. We have a really cool password exposure test tool that I'll show you in just a second that will check and see if your company's passwords, network passwords are out there on the internet. Or you can check it if you want to do it one at a time. You can go to a really famous website, fairly or infamous website that was created by Troy Hunt called Have I Been Pond? He's a, he was a Microsoft employee. I think he still is a Microsoft employee, but he could have gone to work for somebody else. But he made this website, HaveIBeenPond.com, many, many years ago. You put in your email address and hit enter, and it will tell you how many times it's been compromised. You can see from this first example on the left that I put in Roger G at Noble4.com, and it's never been compromised that he knows of. I put in my personal email address, though, Roger at Banner at CS.com, and it's been co compromised now like 12 times. And it's nothing I ever did. I didn't get fished, as far as I know. Almost every one of them was from a successful exploitation of another uh, website that I'd put a login name and password on. And they're not like not rare ones. It's like, you know, Adobe.com, Facebook, Twitter, they've all been compromised at various times over the years. And my login names and passwords got in them. And the problem is, is even if you've changed your passwords, many times people don't know their passwords are in there. But even if they have been compromised, sometimes people have passwords like frog one, frog two, frog three, frog four. And if they look it up and have I been pond, if an attacker looks it up in a password dump list, if they see, oh, Roger has password frog one and the password frog two, and password frog three, you can guess what they're going to try on Rogers Corporate Network next. They're probably going to try Frog 4, 5, and 6, something like that. But again, I think instead of if you don't want to run that tool, uh, a Troy Hunt one at a time, you can use the Password Exposure Test tool. You can go to uh, knowbefore.com forward slash resources, find our password exposure test, and it will tell you how many of the login names on your company network, how many people have pat weak passwords, number one, like password and stuff, but also they'll compare it against the password, the various password dump lists out there on the internet and the black web and tell you how many of them, how many of your company's login names appear. And if you get a lot of them, you want to tell those people, hey, you probably just to, as a precaution want to change your password one more time, which is why it's always good to change your password at least once a year, if not more often. You can also have people that have uh, get their account taking over someone 
makes an attack, social engineers them or does something in a way, resets their account, takes over their account. Like one of the, uh, the easiest ways these password reset questions are known as knowledge based questions where you can actually say, uh, you know, a site will say, oh, you want to reset your password? What's your mother's maiden name? Well, I don't know whoever thought that your mother's maiden name was a secret, but you should never these websites that ask these questions like this are horrible because whatever the questions are, they're easier to take a guess at than what your password may be. Google even published a great white paper years ago called Secret Lies and Account Recovery, Lessons from the Use of Personal Knowledge Questions at Google. And what they determined is that 20% of recovery questions can be guessed on the first try by an attacker. One fifth of the time, a hacker can guess on the first try what their answer is. And I like the second thing here, 40% of the time, 40%, almost half the people are unable to successfully recall their own real recovery answers. I don't know what that means, but I think it means that if you can't remember your recovery answer, maybe you call a hacker. And one sixth of the time, people's answers can be found on their social media profile. And those attacks have been involved in taking over many people's accounts because, you know, like if the question is, what's your favorite car? It's probably not an AMC uh, Pacer or Gremlin. It's probably going to be, you know, if you can guess, you know, what are the top sexy cars that people want? Lamborghini, a Lexus, you know, a BMW or, you know, Corvette or whatever. That's far easier to guess. Uh, and so you should never, never put in the real answers here. This is not Jeopardy. When they ask you, what's your high school? What's your mother's maiden name? Frog, frog. You know, what's your uh, high school mascot? Pizza, pizza, 32. You, This is not Jeopardy. You don't have to put the real answers in there. You should always put a fake answer. Sadly, that means you have to write down the password question and answer so you can remember what the fake answer is that you gave it if it ever questions you. But that's my advice to you is never put the real answers in there. That is just crazy. And then sometimes if you're a password hacker, all you have to do is ask. I've been a password penetration tester for 20 years of my career. And many times I would walk up and go, hi, my name is Roger Grimes. I need to know what your password is. And they just told me. And if you think that's just crazy, you got to go see. I can't show you this video, but you need to go look up, put in Jimmy Kimmel password video. And he for years has interviewed people randomly on the street in Hollywood and just go, what's your password? And you would think that no Nobody would tell you what their password is. Uh, it's like 10 people every video telling the world what their password is. It is like literally one of the funniest things you've said. And if you don't think people are that stupid, you just don't know enough people. <laughs> people will just tell you their password many times. So out of all of those attacks, what do I recommend? What's my po password policy recommendation here? Well, first of all, this is what I would say. This is what I tell everybody. 70 to 90 percent of all malicious data breaches are due to social engineering and they do not care about what your password policy is 20 to 40 percent of all successful attacks are due to unpatched software they do not care what your passwords are so if you take every other if you take the two most common ways that people are attacked social engineering and unpatched software it accounts for 70 to 90 percent of all malicious data breaches meaning that only 30 10 to 30 percent or something else and actually if you add those two together only one to ten percent of the risk of a malicious data breach comes from something that 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 is related to your password. So that are related to something that would care what your password policies are. Let me say that again. Only one to ten percent of the risk cares about what your password policy is at all, because otherwise they steal your password, social engineer your password. They don't care about the complexity of your password or how long or how complex it is. It could be 100 characters long. If they fish you out of it, if they buffer overflow you because you didn't apply a patch or something, they do not care what your password or password policy is. So remember that. But so password policy only impacts authentication attacks and only some of those. And it includes password guessing and cracking. So most organizations would be far better off concentrating and stopping social engineering and better patching than worried about their password policy. But I assume you all came here because you wanted <laughs> to have a good password policy. And I'm here to tell you and when people say, what should my password policy be? Well, it includes a certain length. What is the minimum length? Should you know what is the complexity that should be required? How long should it be good for before it expires? Um, you know, what's your account policy, you know, account lockout policy is, should you have it enabled, what should the number be, uh, and that sort of stuff. And also your password policy should also say, hey, don't reuse your password on other websites. 
and uh, you know it shouldn't be you shouldn't allow common passwords like password or one 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 or password thirty two or something like that. Uh, you know, password policy is more th than just length or complexity, right? It's how long it's used, how long a person can use a password before uh, they have to change it, which always, let me say, should be at most a year in that particular case and the maximum password life or expiration period. But you also have to protect all the involved components. If you don't do, if you don't do good patching, your password policy doesn't matter, right? So, but when most people say, what should my password policy be? What they usually mean, is it strong? What it, how long is the minimum password length? And does it, is it complexity and what needs to be involved in the complexity and that sort of stuff? I try to tell people that just remember a password system is made up a whole lot of components in that. And if you miss, if you forget to patch one of them, the whole thing fails or someone gets socially engineered, the whole thing fails. The original password policy is most people today came from NIST back in the early 2000s and what was called their electronic authentication guideline. It was a special, it's NIST special publication 800-63. And what they said is that passwords must be long, complex and frequently changed so people can't guess them or crack them. That's what NIST said back in 2003, and that is what almost every password policy, every organizational password policy says today is that they must be long, uh, although they, you know, how long it should be is kind of a matter of uh, what debate. Typically, it means at least eight characters. Uh, how, you know, they have to be changed at least every 45 or 90 days or maybe one year, uh, and they must have some complexity, some uppercase, lowercase, maybe a symbol in there, a number or something like that. That is the password policy most of us know and have followed for most of our computer security lives. But then three years ago in June 2017, NIST updated their uh, that, that guide uh, and they renamed it Digital Identity uh, Guidelines. Uh, although I got a misspelling there, <laughs> instead of identity, identify. Uh, but they said that based upon two year, two decades of data collection, what we told you was wrong. And that you making long, complex, requiring long, complex passwords that are frequently changed actually will hurt you. And you should not do that. They now say you should not require complexity. You should not require long length and you should not require regularly forced password changes. Uh, that this blew up the world. Everybody, this was big news for days and weeks. And I've talked about it a whole lot of times. So again, the NSA said we were wrong. The guy that wrote the original identity guideline said we were wrong and you shouldn't do that with your password. So now it's been three years. How many people have adopted the new NIST policy? Almost nobody. Most people don't even know about it. Most people on this call today probably don't know that the NIST changed their mind and said, don't do what we used to tell you to do. No one actually uses it because almost no one can use it because no security regulation or guide I know of, including PCI DSS or HIPAA, NERC, Sarbanes-Oxley, follows it or allows it. In fact, if you followed NIST's new password policy, you would probably fail your audit on the password uh, on the password question, right? When they ask you whether they're long, complex, and frequently changed, even though the United States government has said that if you use what we recommended as passwords, you know, long, complex, frequently changed, you're more likely to be compromised than if you didn't follow our advice. Although Microsoft uh, give them kudos. They they don't recommend a policy now. They used to recommend a policy long, complex, frequently changed every 45 days. They now no longer recommend any policy. Say it's up to you. So I try to think about what about password attacks? Password attack types that they do not care about your password strength are most of them. <laughs> you know, social engineering, stealing, lookups, account takeovers, asking for your password. They don't care what your password is because they just get whatever it is. The only passwords that actually, the only password attacks that are actually affected by password policy are really password guessing and password hash cracking. Uh, the vast majority of password attacks are the other types. And that's the whole reason this said don't use the old policy. And really, if they've got your password hash, it's kind of game over because they're already in as admin root or domain admin or something. So really, the only reason why you're requiring long complex passwords is to stop password guessing. And they really don't have to be that long or that complex to stop a password guessing uh, attacker from being successful. Uh, so this is what, remember this guessing is usually, password guessing is usually done against an active service at a login prompt, right? And moderately strong passwords uh, will defeat it. Account lockout will help defeat password guessing. Password cracking, however, is against already stolen password hashes. And there really is no defense against the password hash cracking to the plain text password, except for having a very long and complex password. Uh, so this is the dilemma that you have to consider is most password attacks, 
will be uh, either don't care about your password policy or will be put down by having just moderately strong password, let's say eight characters, some complexity, and that takes care of everything fine. It's whether or not how much you worry about password hash cracking. Personally, I don't worry about it that much because they're already in as you know, domain admin or something. They already have the keys to the kingdom. What do they care about your hash? Most password attackers do not crack password hashes back to their plain text equivalents anymore, but some do. So really it's up to you. There are some scenarios that if a password attacker cracks your password hashes, you know, again, they can use it to see if you use your password somewhere else where your hash is not accepted. Uh, you know, they can use it to try to, uh, you know, log in to an external login prompt that they weren't using before. There are some password attack scenarios where if they crack your password hash back to the plain text password, it gives them some additional avenues of attacks. I personally believe, though, it's fairly game over. They can just do, you know, install a keylogger and get your password, or they can install a Trojan or add themselves to the admin group or something like that. Uh, but there are, you know, stopping password hash cracking. It's not very common attacks, but they do happen. And if you prevent password hash cracking by using very long, complex passwords, you put those down as well. So again, what is a strong password? It's a password that's not easily guessable. Again, you can get that with an eight character password with some complexity in there, especially if your login prompts have account lockout enabled. But if you want your passwords to be uncrackable, they have to resist hundreds of trillions of guesses a second. It requires a much longer and more complex password, like 16 characters, a complexity, maybe it gets longer every year or two. Um, account lockouts will help prevent password guessing attacks, but not cracking attacks. So the whole idea, again, is NIST is now saying you don't need to worry about password hash cracking that much because it doesn't happen that much. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, when you tell people to use longer, more complex passwords, they're more often to reuse them across multiple unrelated websites and services and makes your company more likely to be hacked because of that fact. That's the important point there. So you have to decide how much you worry about password hash cracking. I'm not that worried about it. Some people are, so it's kind of up to you. Know that truly random passwords and what we think is the complex passwords are not truly that random or that complex, like Roger is a goon, right? That, that, may, that would fulfill the password complexity requirements for most companies, but it really isn't that complex. It's no more complex than Roger Grimes 3. There, you know, it's a, it's a root English word followed by some uppercase, lowercase, maybe a strange character. That's what most password guessers are going to guess anyways. What truly random high entropy, what's called high entropy, truly random passwords look like is this gobbledygook. Problem is that is people don't like to create them, use them, or remember them. So it can be tough to really, it, it can be hard to require true randomness, high entropy in a password. So again, most people like to use this complex password that is just like uppercase, first character followed by lowercase characters after that with a number one or two at the end uh, and maybe one of these four or five characters in there. These are considered complex. These will stop password guessing attacks per se, but not password cracking attacks. So that's the, you know, the thing is, is that it's really good if you can use a really strong and random password and you don't have to remember it. But either way, if you want to figure out how strong your password really is, here's some websites to go to to see how strong your password is. Although don't put in your real password. You don't know who these people are you don't know what they'll do with your password. So if you go to put in a password, like you want to see if your password dog dog 32 is, use cat cat 23. You don't want to put your real password in there. You just want to put something that's like your real password, but that way these people you don't know don't get your real password. Also, if you're interested, I can send you, if you email me at rogerg at knowbefore.com, I can send you a password hashing spreadsheet where you can put in your password policy, how many days that you do forced password changes, how fast people can guess, and I'll tell you whether or not that password attacker would be successful against your password policy. Feel free to send me an email and I'll send you those spreadsheets. But the whole thing too to remember is if you uh, you can increase how many guesses it takes for somebody to guess or crack your password and you can do that with length and or complexity. Uh, if people have to remember their passwords, I'm a big believer in using length versus complexity because in complexity people don't like to use a whole lot. But if I tell you my passwords, Roger jumped over the dog and cat, that's a very long complex password that would take four quintillion years to crack. Uh, you know, but the typical complex password that we think is complex, like Roger, GRI, 2, that would only take three days for a 
the computer to crack, uh, but the complex password in the middle there that would take 41 trillion years, very hard to create that, very hard to remember that, very hard to reuse that unless you have a password manager. Uh, but again, if you use just a long password, like a passphrase, it's both, that is a very tough one to crack, even harder than the entropy one, the high entropy one in the middle there. Uh, but again, human beings really are really bad at making long, complex, truly pass, uh, long and complex passwords. So I recommend using a password manager. Password managers are really great. They allow the creation, storage, and easy use of very long, complex passwords that are different for all the different websites and services in there. I'm big believers in it. Mine uh, will even tell me if I've got a password, like if a website gets cracked and my password becomes vulnerable, it will proactively tell me that I need to change my password. So I'm a big believer in password managers. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, I've talked about the positives and the negatives on them, but overall, I do like password managers, and I think everybody should use one when they can. If you're trying to think about what password manager you should use, I recommend going to uh, wired.com and searching for password manager review. They review eight different password managers, and I like their comments there, but it's up to you. You can also use multi-factor authentication. Uh, just know that MFA it can't be used in most places, so you're going to have to use passwords. And even if people use MFA, they need to know that they can still be attacked. We have eBooks on it, white papers on it that I wrote. You can even go to the multi-factor security assessment tool at Noble4.com's website, and you can put in the traits. We'll ask a bunch of questions. You put in the traits of your MFA tool, and we'll tell you whether or not we can, how I can tell you all the ways my brain can successfully hack your MFA. And of course, you can buy my book, and I discuss 55 ways of hacking multi-factor authentication. But here's my password policy guidelines, and you have to decide what your risk tolerance is, and particularly around if you're worried about password cracking because most of the other risks can be put down by just a non-easily guessable password. But to prevent password hash cracking, you have to go longer and more complex. Let me keep going here. So here's my password policy recommendations. Use MFA where you can and where it makes sense. Now, uh, if you have a password manager, then you should require long and complex passwords to be used. If you can't use a password manager, people should use an 8 to 12 character password with some complexity. Uh, but you don't have to have great complexity in it. But if you're concerned about password hash cracking attacks, then you need a 16, 17 character password with some complexity in it. Make sure to enable account lockout wherever you can. But more importantly, tell everybody don't reuse passwords to any, any website or service and don't use easily guessable passwords no matter what. And make sure you change your passwords at least once a year so that way if they end up on a password dump site, you don't need to worry about it. With that, again, I'm going to uh, tell you the vast majority of password hash cracking risk is eliminated by passwords that are eight characters or longer uh, and, and, and telling people don't reuse passwords to an, any website or service. I'm, gonna, I'm kind of running out of time here. I wanted to get some questions. You can download and read the rest of this. I apologize, a lot of stuff here. Um, and, and just know uh, you uh, know before has a lot of good information on the website. If I, if you have a question we don't get to today, just email me at rogerg at noble4.com. And with that, David, let's try to take some questions in the last three or four minutes we have. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow, Roger, take a breath. Uh, that was just a flood of mind blowing, uh, uh, awesome content. So i um, not sure what else to say. It was it was amazing. So thank you. Uh, we do have some questions for you. First question here from Chris. Um, do you trust those password apps to be safe and secure and store your passwords? Uh, yeah, I mean, as long as they're well known and that sort of stuff, uh, you know, I'm, I, I don't I'm not so much about password apps as I do like password managers, uh, especially if you pay a little bit for them and it stores your password stuff locally and securely. I like that more than something that maybe st uh, stores it on the internet. Got it, okay. And then what are the recommended password complexity guidelines specifically for the financial industry? Same as I've given you here, <laughs> no different. All right, um, let's see, someone wants you to create that T-shirt about, um, dumb people. Uh, another question here. Um, what's the best password manager? Any recommendations there? Uh, again, I'd say go to, you know, I do have some that I like, but we don't like to recommend any particular product. But I'd say go to Wired Magazine at wired.com and put in password manager review. And I, I agree with their comments. I think they look at eight different password managers. I agree with what they said. Okay. And then uh, will passwordless authentication like biometrics ultimately replace traditional passwords? And if so, could that be a net benefit from for end user security? I can hack biometrics faster than I can hack a password, but uh, 
So I'm not a big fan of biometrics. But, you know, I've been hearing that passwords are going away for 33 years and they still have it. And we all have more passwords than ever before. I think we're at least 10 years away from that. There are things that are going to replace passwords, I think, in the future, uh, like behavioral diet, you know, uh, behavioral analytics and whether you're coming from a previously registered device and are you doing normal things that you'd normally be doing. But I think we're still, you know, I think we're at least 10 years off from passwords going away. And anybody that tells you any different, I'd like to make a bet. Um, another question here about um, many applications or um, companies don't allow multi-factor authentication. Um, any, rec any idea on why that is? Or do you think that's something that every app and every company should be implementing? Yeah, you know, the reason I kind of covered that early on, passwords just work. And infants to old people can use passwords. And actually, if you... You know, if you don't get fished out of them and you and your password system, you know, doesn't get compromised, they're fairly safe. Some of the some of the world's uh, crypt, crypto biggest cryptocurrency people that have lost tens of millions of dollars, they've lost that usually because of multi-factor authentication. And a lot of those people have gone back to simple login name and passwords. I do. For some of my most secure accounts, I use a login name and password that I know I will not be socially engineered out of. Uh, and if you do that, it can be a fairly secure thing. It, it's a lot of and let me say, as I put in my book, Hacking Multi-Factor Authentication, any of the replacements to passwords can be hacked to death. And they will be. As we move from less passwords to more MFA and stuff, they're just going to be hacked. The hackers are just going to move along. They already are. Got it. Okay. And then probably last question here we have time for. Um, so you're saying no to biometrics, but you recommend two-factor authentication? I mean, I, I like multi-factor authentication where you can. I have particular types that I like in particular, especially like phone apps that do push-based stuff, FIDO2, things like that. There's others like SMS-based uh, that I don't like. There, there's a lot of buggy, terrible MFA out there. So I like some of it. I like a lot of it out there. There's a lot of it's just junk as well. So it really depends. And let me say this. If we all moved 100% MFA, we would probably just be hacked just as much as we are today. MFA is not the panacea that people think it is. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to read your book to learn more about hacking multi-factor authentication. Uh, I'm afraid we're all out of time today for live Q&A, uh, but Roger has so graciously provided his email address there, rogerg at nobefore.com, if we didn't get to any of those questions. Roger, it's been fantastic having you on the event. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thanks, everybody, for joining us on a Friday. Before we go, I want to announce the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card that's going out to Mark Watson from Pennsylvania. Congratulations. We'll reach out via email to deliver that gift card. Of course, thank you everyone for joining us again uh, on this Friday afternoon. I hope that you enjoyed the event and learned a lot. I know that I learned so much about uh, password security. So again, thank you to Roger. Thank you to Know Before. And thank you to our audience. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care, everyone.